Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I'm glad you're here. It may have been hard to get here in the cold, but it's good you came. And more importantly, God is glad you're here, sitting before his feet, listening to his word, and giving thanks to him. But today is another Sunday morning and another day to find excuses to not come to church, isn't it? And oh, we do come up with the excuses. It's too far away, it's too hot, too cold, too long, too boring. We're not getting anything out of it. The hymns are too slow, too fast. It's always the same thing. It's never the same thing. Lots of excuses. And a lot of times the excuses don't stick. And we find ourselves in church every week, and we thank God for that. Sometimes we come to church every week bringing the excuses with us in hopes that we can change things so that in the end we have other excuses not to go to church. We don't thank God for that. And sometimes the excuses actually lead us to abandoning the church. Sometimes for years, and sometimes we never go back. And we pray to God that such people do come back. Life gets in the way. We hold our our lives, our work, our family, our school, our sports at at least as important as church on Sunday morning. And we put so much energy into such things that when Sunday morning comes, we might not have the energy or desire left for church. We're happy with just enough Jesus to get by, just enough to get us a pass. But we must ask, is this a characteristic of Christ in us, of the Spirit who dwells in us, or is it a characteristic of the old nature, the old sinful nature rearing its ugly head? See, the sinful nature has no interest in God or the church or salvation or scripture or any of it. It wants what it wants, and it doesn't want God. It it wants the world. It wants the devil, and and, and time in church, time in prayer, time in scripture is like like violent acid to the sinful nature. We should love church, and we should desire to be in church all the time, not just every Sunday, but every day, because we love God, and we love Jesus, and we love being in his presence. Well, sometimes. Sometimes. You remember a time not so long ago when churches were left open and the sanctuary lights lit and people would just walk in and sit and pray throughout the day. In the cities, even at night, some churches would remain open for sinners to enter and confess their sins. But now, we put in our hour, we make our presence known, and then we go home. It should be natural for us, but it's not. But guess what? For Jesus, it is very natural. In our gospel reading, we discover just how natural it is for Jesus. He came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Worship is a part of Jesus' life. It is customary. It is habit. Yes, worship and habit fit together like glue. It is habit to be in synagogue, to be in the word, to be in prayer, to be in worship. For Jesus, it isn't a duty or an obligation. It isn't, oh, geez, I got to go to synagogue to sing those boring hymns and listen to that long-winded scribe talk about the Torah again. No, for Jesus, it's about love. He loves being in the presence of his Father. Now, in the synagogues, there were all sorts of various ornaments and, and symbols to help the worshippers' eyes and thoughts remain focused on the Word, just, just like we have today. And above the front of the space, sort of like the area above our chancel, were written the words, and this was in Hebrew, Da lafni mi atach amed. And every synagogue had this written. In English, it means, know before whom you stand. Know before whom you stand. Some of our churches today have just outside their sanctuary a sign or something which reads, let there be silence 
this is the Lord's house. The idea that one could just worship at home and then skip synagogue or could go stare at a tree and then skip worship, it existed back then. And this more popular idea today, you know, I can worship God in my own way. I don't need the church and the established religion. That's not from our new nature, but it's from that expression of the old nature, finding ways to weasel out of going to church and ultimately finding ways to keep you from confessing that you are a sinner. Well, it all existed then, too. Not everyone went to synagogue, and they all had their reasons. But not with regard to Jesus. Obviously, he doesn't need to confess his sins. But even as the Son of God, who knows the Scripture because he wrote it, it is his word, he still goes to synagogue, follows the customs, does the liturgy, says the blessed bees, the prayers, and the Shema, and stands to do the silent prayer, and all the other parts of the order of the service that follow. See, Jesus loves it. He loves being there. It's a joy, and there is no room, no need for offense. And for his whole life, Jesus went to synagogue week after week, Sabbath after Sabbath, singing the hymns, reciting the psalms, doing the liturgy, because that's what it was to be a devout Jew, and because he loved it. It was his custom. But this Sunday is different. Something does change. Rather than coming to synagogue as the son of Joseph the carpenter, Jesus comes as the teacher, the rabbi. And because he is now of age, he is permitted to preach and to read the scripture standing at the bimah, the lectern at the front of the synagogue. This will be the first time that the people of Nazareth see their, their golden boy, Jesus, whom they love and respect, do his duty as the firstborn. He's handed the scroll from Isaiah. It was probably the lectionary text for the day. And he reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You know, it's always a joy when we see a confirmed, a confirmad stand up and acolyte or read or take part in the service, right? And it's sort of the same response at the synagogue. The people see Jesus, whom they know and love, standing up to read and preaching his first words. And notice Jesus' sermon. Today, the churches that really attract a lot of people, you very often notice a different type of sermon preached. More often than not, I would say over 50% of the time, maybe 60, 70 Sermons in fastly growing churches are self-help sermons. Ten steps to a better you, seven steps to more money, five steps to this, four steps to that. Therapeutic sermons. Sermons that have very little to do with Jesus and a whole lot to do with, with you. And if I can preach a sermon which is attractive to your sinful nature and give it a snazzy title, guess what? People will come by the droves. The sinful nature knows what, it's wa what it wants. The spirit is willing, it's the flesh that's weak. And our spirits want to hear Jesus, but our flesh wants nothing but to be scratched and satisfied and to hear about itself. But Jesus' sermon isn't a social justice rally cry or a lecture or a therapy lesson or anything like that. It's simply taking the, the word of the Lord and applying it to the people. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, says Jesus. In other words, Jesus says, these words written in Isaiah, they're all about me. The words from the scroll of Isaiah jump out and speak to the people. See, it's not just preaching about the words. Jesus isn't just talking about what he reads. He is the words. He is the scroll. And every word that comes from the mouth of Jesus is God's word. Because he is God. John writes that Jesus is the word become flesh. The book of Hebrews says that the word is living and active. Not was living and active, but is living and active. The word is present here, today, for you. These words aren't just regular words on paper written by random folk. These are God's words. 
This is God's word, written how he wants it written, for your benefit. And the Lord has given you his word, the good news of Jesus, who has come to set you free and shine a light upon you. Jesus does this, as St. Paul writes, through the hearing of the word. Faith comes by hearing. This is why preaching is such, and always has been, such a fundamental part of the church, and why it's necessary to be here. Look at our gospel reading. Worship for Jesus isn't about making the people happy, keeping up with trends. Worship is about the word. Faithful preaching, right teaching, and he himself being present in worship. Now, the reason the worshipers in the synagogue get so upset when Jesus preaches is because he speaks offensive words. Offensive to their presuppositions, to their stubbornness, to their faithlessness. His words are offensive to their human nature. He tells them that they are a lot like, they are no better than their ancestors who kicked out the prophets, and the prophets could only help the Gentiles. Wow. That's not something you say at a Jewish synagogue that you're trying to grow. But Jesus doesn't change his message. He doesn't soften the blow or try hard not to offend. He called the disciples evil. He told Peter he had Satan speaking through him. He told the Pharisees that their father was the devil, that they were whitewashed tombs. Jesus isn't scared to offend. He told a whole group of disciples, you know, the potential church members, that to have life in them, they must eat his flesh and drink his blood. And most of them turned and left. Do you think Jesus regretted that conversation? I don't. And we should not regret it when in our being faithful to God and his word, we offend. Because it is in that offense where the spirit works and churns the heart and can bring people to repentance and faith. See, the idea of being attractional or inclusive, it's from a wrong understanding. Jesus says that he draws people. And then he says that we are to be faithful to his word. Jesus says that his word draws people, that his spirit draws people. And again, we are to be faithful to his word. The word is living and active, and it speaks boldly. It speaks boldly from this book to all who hear it, and his word draws people to Jesus. It's not our methods or our cleverness or of speech or programs that will draw people to this church or to any church, and it certainly won't nurture the faith. Our job is to be faithful with his word and not try to hide it or bury it under good intentions or attempts it to be inviting or by hiding the offensive stuff or anything of the sort. Too many churches in the last 50 or 60 years have abandoned faithfulness for attractiveness, integrity for plurality, fidelity for inclusiveness, such that, that the things that churches cared for forever are no longer talked about, and the things that the church called wrong and backward forever are now considered acceptable. We got too offended. And it seems that we threw Jesus off the cliff. In our thinking too highly of ourselves, we have built another tower of Babel, believing that our good works and our progress has moved us closer to God and that our intellectual superiority means we don't need his word as much anymore. But God tore that tower down, remember? See, God's word is offensive. It's offensive to our old nature. In us, which hates God and hates Jesus. And that nature, as buried in our baptisms as it is, is still there clinging to the life preserver of temptation and the long rope of doubt and skepticism, thus that even we may find offense in Scripture. But with repentant contrition and humility, may we be reformed and conformed to Jesus. I was 25 years old before I finally repented and accepted that baptism saves and that bread and wine are the body and blood. Before then, I argued with pastors like I was some sort of theological mastermind. 
what I really was was an arrogant, obstinate fool. I didn't want Jesus except in the way I wanted him, and no pastor, no church was going to tell me what I'm supposed to believe. Looking back, I'm glad that I had pastors who stuck with me and weren't scared to get in my face. But I'm sure they shed a few tears also over the things that I said to them. And I suspect that some of you are in the same boat today, even as you come to church and find offense. Yet there is really good news. Jesus, in spite of the fact that his preaching in the synagogue that finds Sabbath would not be accepted, it was totally rejected, he preaches anyway. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And in spite of our indifference, in, in spite of our tendency to get bored or distracted, to those things that make us too busy for church, when we find offense at Jesus' words, Jesus continues to come and join us in this place all the more. He knows that sometimes we feel like throwing him off a cliff. He knows that sometimes we are just not going to easily accept what he has to say. He doesn't have to come to be, our, to be in our presence. He chooses to be because he loves us. And that's great news, isn't it? Week after week, Sunday after Sunday, he listens to our confession of sins, and he forgives us our sins. He hears our prayers, he hears us sing the hymns, and he, and he asks the angels to sing along with us. And even though we might get tired of it all, even though we might get tired of it all, he never, ever does. See, worship isn't about us. This service isn't about feeding our needs or fulfilling our wants. The service is about Jesus. We can go to Hardee's if, if we want to feed our needs. We can go to the Dollar General if we want something. When we come here, we come here to be with Jesus. A young man on Facebook in a church liturgy group that I'm a part of he wrote something very profound. I doubt he knew how profound it was, and I'm quoting, Learning to worship rightly, he writes, needs to involve learning to worship when it's the last thing you want to do. When nothing is going your way, when there are distractions, reasons to be offended, when the pastor says or does something that is just completely out of bounds, or when others in the pews get us riled up, to still be able to come here and sit and listen at Jesus' feet. That's what it's all about. See, worship isn't about us wanting to be here. Worship is about Jesus who is here, who wants to be here, who loves to be here, who wants to hear you sing and listen to you pray and forgive you of your sins. He comes to give you mercy and salvation and hope and peace. He comes to teach you his word, to preach to you his message of salvation, to answer your prayers and to give you his very body and blood, just as he did for his disciples, just as he did for the whole world when he died on the cross. Nothing has changed. Jesus is the teacher. He is the preacher. He is the rabbi who has come to fulfill prophecy and to be your good news. Me? I'm just an instrument. I'm just a, I'm just a puppet who does and is to, and what I'm told and speaks what I'm given to speak. Jesus is the speaker. He is the preacher. He is the one serving this congregation. He is the one forgiving you of your sins and assuring you of your salvation. I simply repeat what he says. He is the one who leads us by the power of his spirit to say, just one service a week? <laughs> we should have a service every day. Because every time we gather here, we get to gather. We get to gather before Jesus' feet and listen. Jesus is the same yesterday when he preached in the synagogue and when he bled and died on the cross. Today when he gathers his flock together before his word and sacraments. And tomorrow when he will gather us all together one last time and forevermore in the great sanctuary of heaven. And Jesus, his whole life on earth was about gathering people before his word. The synagogue, gathering the disciples, the Sermon on the Mount, the feeding of the 5,000, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and the gathering of the few who stood before him when he died on the cross. All of it is about gathering his people together. And in his own words, as a hen gathers her chicks, right? 
And here in this place, Jesus gathers us together to listen and to learn at his feet. As with Martha, we often get distracted with all the busyness and other things. We get very outside of, inside of ourselves, wanting things a certain way. But Jesus says to us, I'm here. I've fulfilled the prophecies. I'm here to set you free. Come sit with me a while and listen. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We now respond to God's word through our